Thanks very much, folks. Um, this is a paper about monuments and typology, but it's taking as its point of departure not the emergence of a monument as a structure, performance, assemblage, or whatever, but instead the erasure and negation of a monument. Now, the question of typology, as will become clear, is a particularly vexed one and painful one for me as a result of events which transpired about 10 years ago, almost to the day. Um, we were writing uh, a monograph relating to our six years of digging at Avebury in Wiltshire, and we were getting close to the completion of the monograph, and I'd written a big chunk of it, and in writing that chunk, I wittingly constructed a couple of typologies, uh, much to the horror and consternation of my colleague and co-author of the paper today. Now, his point was this. Having spent the previous 10 years arguing against the need for typologies and the lingering whiff of modernity that seemed to cling to their very classes, to be then implicated in the wholly uncritical creation of one was his worst nightmare come true. <laughs> Ouch, that really hurt. I worked really, really hard on this. And um, I was horrified. And that horror has lived with me ever since, to the point where I got the invite to give a paper here. I thought, oh no, <laughs> not typology. Um, but as a result, this paper may well involve a little bit of me oversharing and possibly a tear or two. Um, its aim isn't catharsis on my part, though I will grab any that's going. Instead, what I want to do is look at what I did wrong, or was deemed to have done wrong, as it became clear to me in the years since that I'm not the only person to come up or confront the problem that, whilst theoretically unpalatable, typologies are bloody useful for thinking with. And so I'm going to really kind of explore that tension. <coughs> to answer the question posed at the start, I do believe that typology has value. What is more, given the chance to do it all again, I'd do exactly the same. Though I'd probably be a bit more crafty about the, uh, the semantics and the uh, terminology I use. Look what I've done, Josh. <laughs> it isn't a typology, whatever it looks like. Why do I think it's useful? Well, the types I'm going to discuss, the typologies I constructed, have subsequently been instrumental in encouraging me to not think in terms of essentializing, bounding, isolating, or reifying, but instead they've encouraged me to think through the possibilities of a very different Avebury, one comprised of flow, emergence, and dynamism. And I found them incredibly productive lenses to explore the archaeology through. So let's have a look at the context. <coughs> Excavations at the site of Avebury over the years have revealed stark evidence for instances of stone burial and stone dismantling, events that took place um, that affected the megalithic settings of the monument from the medieval period onwards. There's examples of stone burials, there's some of the ones we dug up, and there's Stukeley's evocative image of a stone breaking event. And try to fix that in the back of your minds as that's, that image is going to crop up uh, in everything that follows. And there are some of the burning events we excavated. Now, repeated encounters with the traces of these events in the field while we were digging, and again, Keeler had encountered these before in the 1930s in his digging, left a strong sense that there'd been a series of shared or recognised ways of doing, manifested as a repertoire of tactics and methodologies that people had drawn upon in creative ways in order to either bury a 20-ton stone or smash onto pieces and redeploy it. And we have a ton of evidence relating to this, carefully excavated and recorded uh, either by us or by Keeler in the 1930s. <coughs> now, my instinctive approach was to try to tease out a distinctive series of types of stone burial and types of stone destruction in order to make sense of this that could be linked to particular stone removal technologies and practices that could then be linked to particular groups or individual stone barriers and stone breakers. That in turn, to me, would shed light upon the tempo and structure of stone burial and breaking in the medieval and post-medieval period, and thus shed light on the later history of the Age of Henge. So that's what I did. I spent a lot of time in the archives working through the evidence we had for stone burial and for stone breaking. And I created a couple of typologies. Uh, how to bury a big sarsen. Um, I'm very proud of these, don't laugh. <laughs> and how to smash one up, if smashing one up is what floated your particular boat. And 
I teased out a series of practical responses to the challenges posed by a given megalith, a repertoire or pool of methods and techniques that together comprised a unique series of folk practices that only appear to have kind of arisen in that part of Wiltshire. In other parts of the country, they were breaking them up in a very different way. These were practices that were drawn upon in distinctive combinations by potentially different groups and individuals. This is how you deal with a stone like this. You do this, this, and this. Or we could be seeing, seeing evidence uh, for the preferred techniques employed by specific groups or individuals. Whatever it's like, this is how we do it. Or some mixture or combination of the both. And that seemed interesting and stimulating. The teasing out of distinctive types, the creation of my new typology, involved engaging with this archival material, particularly the 1930s records, which had never been formally published. They are, they're in a section called Dilapidations in the published monograph, stone burial, stone breaking, get a paragraph each, and that's it. Yet there was a wealth of subtle detail, very nuanced detail relating to these events. So I dived into the archives, our archive and the 30s archive, and carefully weighed up similarities and dissimilarities between events broadly deemed to be of the same character, burial, percussive breakage, or burning. As well as a hunt for what I'd noticed when we were digging these things, which um, we might, you might think of them as tells in a gambling sense, kind of distinctive hints that, that the same people had, done, had carried out these activities. They'd left their own little kind of whiff or signature about it that was suggestive of particular ways of doing, preferred ways of doing, by individuals or groups. And in this sense, rather than adopt a rigidly discursive or mechanical approach to typology in Sorison's uh, sense, I tacked reductively between the two. Yeah, looking for similarities, dissimilarities, and, and these, these intangible, well, tangible tells, uh, which kind of hinted at individuals and people. And the results were typologies of stone burial and stone breaking, of which I was very, very proud. Um, I saw these as essential platforms from which new stories and histories could be written of Avebury in the historic periods, a period which, been, up until that time, had been largely neglected. These weren't closed types, they weren't intended to be closed types. And there's a significant bleed between and across them, particularly when people found a buried stone and then burned it. You had bundles of practices separated by about 300 years clashing and coming together in productive and interesting ways. Now, proud of my efforts, I was, after all, engaging with questions of practice, local contingent knowledge, direct material engagements that unfolded in often dramatic, unpredictable ways. Proud of that, I completed my chapters and presented them to my oh. colleague. And that's where things started to go hideously wrong. I thought I'd done something special. Um, and uh, you know, opened up a new chapter of Avery's history. But the reaction from my colleagues was chilly, to say the least. Now, the problem with typologies um, has been discussed extensively, and some of the earlier papers have alluded to this. And um, Julian Thomas has quite you know, elegantly summed this up in his discussion of uh, modernity where typology sits alongside a raft of other established archaeological practices that are designed to break the world down in order that, to enable its, uh, its comprehension, the modern war against chaos. And a host of authors have flagged limitations with typology as a tool of modernity. More recently, Ingold has drawn attention to the logic of inversion, which he claims is deeply sedimented within the canons of Western thought where beings originally open to the world are closed in upon themselves, sealed by an outer boundary. And as Britton and Jones have argued, typology not only assumes the things it is seeking to classify have an a priori existence, they've gone further, uh, and I quote from Jones here, in many senses, typochronological schemes negate our understanding, as categorization or classification tends to substitute for understanding. Ouch, yeah, there's the problem. That's what caused the chilly reception. Needless to say, I was gutted. Absolutely gutted. Maybe I just didn't get it. Um, how damning would reviews of the monograph be when it got published, if it ever got published? Would I ever be invited to tag again? Could I ever show my face at tag again? There's an irony there, isn't there? 
But the more I thought about it, the more puzzled I became. The typologies had, after all, been able to tease out a set of unique and interesting folk practices that had to date been dismissed as mere vandalism. Perhaps more importantly, when I looked at it, other sections of the monograph were absolutely rammed full of types. Grooveware styles, lithic tool classes, even terms such as henge. How could he use them and I couldn't? <laughs> and what was also interesting about the growing body of critique of typologies was the concomitant tendency to admit that, despite their fundamental flaws, they could be quite useful. Now, in a world of flow, emergence, assemblage, and fluidity, it seemed to be okay to use existing typologies, <coughs> you could enhance them and finesse them, if they were deemed to be useful. Yeah? They provided a way in, or a starting point, or served to ensure that any potential babies were glued firmly to the bottom of the bath before you emptied it. This could be explicit, and Chris Fowler has really been you know, upfront about confronting this. Um, or it could be implicit in the fact that the pages of their discussions, their volumes, are rammed full of use of types. What was going on? What was I doing that was so different? And more importantly, where was the line drawn that I'd obviously crossed? Were my typologies really sinking to bound and objectify, drawing upon broad similarities at the expense of difference in order to arrest the flow and flux of the past, in order to parcel it up into a series of distinctive bounded entities? I didn't think so. Why were my new typologies a deal breaker when reference to established typologies seemed to be okay, a necessary evil? Was it because mine were new? I was not merely utilising an established typology born out of centuries of hard graft. I was seeking cheekily to build a new one. This in turn raises the question, how old does it have to be before it's established enough to use with apologia? I was left with two options. What to do? I can cry, cry myself to sleep on a few nights. I could either wait it out until my typologies were established enough for bright young things to use them, use them if they had to, but use them anyway, or I could start to think about alternatives. Um, had I wasted my time, or was there anything of value there? <coughs> Given I was trying to tease out distinctive types of performance, I turned to recent writing on performance and uh, performativity in order to shed some more light on what these typologies might be, what our types might be. And they seem to offer some beguiling suggestions as to how to uh, take this work forward, not least in completely reformulating what a type and thus typology might actually be. Now, Sorensen had argued that most objects um, are made with an awareness of other objects, and refers to this as inter-object citation of selective characteristics. And this is echoed, I think, in Jones's work, important work, on performativity, and the notion that rather than fixed, stable entities, types are instead performed. Now, this is stimulating stuff. You could certainly replace object with practice in Sorensen and Jones's arguments and start to approach the situation I was dealing with, really, the destruction and burial of stones. Whilst the referential chain for stone burial is a little opaque for stone breaking and destruction, we could argue one exists. They started to be broken down on the downs, natural sarsens, natural stones, and that was then taken through and applied to megaliths. And in many ways, these destruction events epitomise Jones's contention that rather than discrete types, we are instead seeing citations of material performances. But it could be argued that the the problem with both Jones and Sorensen's kind of topological approaches is that citations, uh, all this does is really displace the problem insofar as it assumes the existence of some original performance or er performance which is citable and then subsequently cited. There's a danger there that research will simply turn into a look for origins and originals. Further, are the similarities due to shared practices or practitioners drawing upon a limited repertoire of of ways of doing, or perhaps shared personnel, groups coming together and bringing their own skills, experience, and idiosyncrasies with them. We know, after all, that some, at least some of the breaking took place within a generation uh, and appeared to be carried out by the same groups of people. To put it another way, are we seeing performed types, as advocated by Jones, or merely types of performance? And can a meaningful distinction be drawn between them? 
Perhaps what we're seeing are types of performance that give rise to the performance of recognisable types that were then mistaken by me for types of performance. <laughs> there will be a test on this at the end. <laughs> Another way forward may lie with assemblage theory, um, which offers a productive and stimulating way of thinking about stone burial and destruction. As particular assemblages of people, objects, imperatives, assumptions, experience emerge at a distinctive, uh, uh, sorry, a series of particular junctures in order to fragment and disperse lumps of sarsen. I'm losing the light here, folks. Instead of types, we might flag a distinct series of performances that emerge as a complex web of personnel, ways of doing, past experience, expectations, stone affordance, weather, proximity to thatched dwellings, grumpy Anglicans, co-opted tools, bespoke tools, drink, food, meat and josh, came together for the purpose of translocating a standing stone or transforming it into something else. But I feel uneasy about the headlong rush towards continual emergence, which is inherent in a lot of the assemblage literature. Um, it seems to leave little room for any sense of stability and persistence, as has been noted by Lucas in his discussion of res residues and enduring assemblages. I think persistence and stability are critical in understanding and considering things like Avery. I need not be uh, placed in opposition or imply an inherent boundedness or essence. I think we can both have vibrancy and stability at the same time, like a stew which is kept bubbling uh, on a stove. As Lucas has argued, assemblages can be stabilised through processes of enchainment and containment that are themselves dynamic. A host of assemblages may emerge in response to the need to territorialise, deterritorialise. Stopping the stew from bubbling over, for example. And see, for example, Astrid Van Oyen's recent work on the critical importance of Rhenish where in the stabilisation <coughs> of Samian, or Gibson's work on pathways. However, I think it's easy to lose sight of this when you... Thank you. Uh, it's easy to lose sight of this um, when the light's going, in approaches which stress instead the pell-mell unfolding of continual emergence. Most recently, I've found taken inspiration from Domingos uh, Rubio's work on what is termed an ecological approach, which really you know, tackles this paradox, this uh, stability and flow. Like Ingold, he contrasts objects and things, the latter is material processes unfolding over time and always changing, the former, a particular moment in the life of some thing. I, it occupies and maintains an object position in order to count as a particular type of object. We can, for example, see a stone burning pit as an object moment in the flow of a thing. Extraction, translocation of a stone, setting as a megalith, object, toppling, fracture, fragmentation, dispersal, reincorporation as a wall, an object, punctuated by other object distances. I'm almost done. He discusses this in the context of more familiar objects, but his work has broader resonance, particularly his emphasis upon the restlessness of things and the processes whereby things grow in and out of objects. In this sense, a type might be thought of as an abstract account of an object position that will eventually always be betrayed and transformed by the constant unfolding of things. Lots of sarsens in an arrangement in a sarsen field, via megalith, via burial, via destruction, to lots of sarsens in an arrangement, walls. Each traversing its own lines through the landscape to create a complex web in time and space. Different object moments emerge at junctures in this flow as a result of different territorialising, deterritorialising forces, as diverse as axe sharpening and 17th century Protestantism. To conclude, once I teased out my types, I looked at how they were distributed through the landscape, I looked at them in terms of chronology, and began to unravel the un overlapping processes that were unfolding over the last 500 years of Avery's history. However, as the complexity began to become manifest, I began to realise that these distinctive traces were not indicative of events that happened to Avebury, they were part and parcel of Avebury as an ongoing fluid process. In the first, stones again began to move in the Avebury landscape, only this time down. In the second, stones once again flowed across the Avebury landscape as new assemblages, earth, chalk, iron, fire, straw and ways of doing emerged in the Avebury landscape. Once again, they created a series of powerful absences and a spatially extended fragmented series of presences linked by, linked by movement and flow. This, in turn, made me rethink how we were approaching, sorry, <laughs> how we were approaching Avery in the late Neolithic. And this idea of Avery as an assemblage that we're now applying to our understanding of 
late Neolithic Avebury emerged through me trying to think through the typologies I'd created in order to understand its destruction. Thank you very much. Thank you.